Our first talk is Adam Jorgensen speaking about Crossbio. Take it away. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, great. Right, so I'm going to be talking about our experiences in asynchronous application development at OpenDNA with Crossbar.io. Now, OpenDNA is a fairly young company. Uh, we work in the machine learning space. We do uh, user behavior analysis and content analysis and so forth. The concept for this talk comes from the ongoing work on a new project, which is currently internal, but we're going to be releasing it to clients. And when we were coming up with the project, we realized we needed to do a fair bit of real-time kind of interaction, pub-sub, that kind of stuff. So we looked at various options, and we ultimately decided, well, we might as well just take the whole thing asynchronous. No point really mixing a synchronous application with an asynchronous component, because it'll just make managing the whole scenario a lot more complicated. So we looked at various solutions and ultimately decided to go with crossbar.io, which is something I had a bit of experience with previously, and um, yeah, other people at the company seemed to like the look of um, when I introduced them to it. So um, a little bit of an initial thing. Um, how many people were here for my previous talk last year about um, crossbar versus celery? OK, not too many. Great. So this slide isn't going to be wasted then. Let's start off at the top. Um, WAMP. Okay, so WAMP is the Web Application Messaging Protocol. It's an open standard for routed RPC and PubSub. This standard is developed by a company formerly called Tavendo. They've now rebranded themselves as Crossbot.io, which is a little bit confusing given that they, the, the, the software they produce is also Crossbot.io. So Autobahn is a library that implements the WAMP standard on top of WebSockets. And Crossbar is a WAMP router, which is implemented using Autobahn. And then obviously, Crossbar.io, the company, they uh, maintain Autobahn and the Crossbar IO router software. Now, Crossbar is, is built primarily um, using Autobahn and um, WAMP. And WAMP is obviously a sub-protocol of web sockets, but it is possible for WAMP to run on uh, raw sockets and pretty much any transport which meets certain characteristics. And, sorry, a bit of a nervous. <laughs> sorry, my brain is fading a little bit here. Didn't have enough time to prep this up front. So Crossbar is a router then which implements WAMP, and it's uh, a WAMP router which manages WAMP clients. WAMP clients connect to the router and interact with each other via either PubSub methodology or routed RPC. Uh, WAMP is a is a multi-language standard. It does not is not restricted to Python. The Autobahn family of libraries, in fact, is, is, covers is Autobahn JS, Autobahn Python, and Autobahn C++. And then there's an entire other range of WAMP client libraries implemented in other languages. There's a particularly unfortunate one um, for Swift called Swamp, uh, which, but our iOS developer said that it's actually not particularly painful to work with, so that's pretty cool. And there are also WAMP routers written in other languages, but at this point in time, Crossbar is the definitive WAMP implementation, and Autobahn, the Autobahn family of libraries, are the definitive WAMP client library implementations. So before we move on to uh, more in-depth um, details, let's just compare a few of the differences between the uh, HTTP protocol and the WAMP protocol. Now, HTTP is obviously something which a lot, a lot of people are more familiar with, um, it's very commonly used in web applications. WAMP is obviously something which is a lot more recent, so given that it builds on web sockets, which is also a relatively new protocol. So starting off the top, um, there are some similarities between the two, um, but plenty of differences as well. So by default, HTTP is stateless, but people writing applications in HTTP tend to model it using a model state in the underlying application whereas a WAMP um, connection is actually stateful in itself. So it's a persistent connection. It's also a bi-directional 
connection, whereas an HTTP connection is obviously unidirectional. You make a request, you get a response. A WAMP connection is bidirectional and it's full duplex. So that means that messages can be being sent and received on both ends of a WAMP connection at the same time simultaneously. This is obviously pretty useful. It's great for implementing um, real-time behavior. Um, it's, it takes a little bit of getting used to if you're used to the standard, more synchronous approach to things. But with, with a, bit of, a, bit of, a bit of time and, 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 and experience with asynchronous applications, it becomes fairly easy to manage once you've got your sort of like teeth wrapped around the idea. Now, HTTP connections, as I said, are there, well, a WAMP connection is obviously persistent and stateful, whereas an HTTP connection by default tends to be transient, but that's kind of ignoring the fact that most HTTP servers tend to use a keep alive HTTP connection, which obviously um, it obviates some of the performance issues with opening and closing an HTTP connection over and over. Now, HTTP provides a lot of um, v method verbs for its protocol. Um, many of these are not, well, not commonly used. The commonly used ones everyone knows. The uncommon ones, I um, mean, you know, I'm not sure how many people have ever used an HTTP trace connection or a patch. Well, patches are obviously pretty common, but you will find there are certain web service frameworks that don't actually accept a patch but require you to send a post and send a specific header to say, oh, this is actually a patch. So it's a bit of, there's a bit of, bit of peculiarity there. WAMP, by comparison, is a lot more simple. There are four verbs, call an RPC function, register an RPC function, subscribe to a topic, publish to a topic. Uh, the message format for HTTP is plain text, so it's very flexible. Anything that you can stick in plain text, you can send by HTTP. WAMP is a bit more restricted. It uh, requires you to send messages using JSON, um, CBOR, or message pack, which are obviously both kind of variants on JSON. Authentication is available at the HTTP level. Uh, it's also built into the WAMP protocol. Authorization, on the other hand, is something which the WAMP protocol has built in, but HTTP as a protocol doesn't really care about. If you're implementing authorization in an HTTP application, you have to do it at your application level, whereas it's actually defined as part of the protocol for WAMP, which is makes for some interesting design choices, as you'll see later on in the talk. So getting started with uh, Crossbar and Autobahn, this is actually a lot easier than it used to be. Um, you can use Docker. You can install a Docker image, start it up, and you've got a, a running crossbar application. You can also use virtual env and just install crossbar into your virtual env. It'll pull in all its dependencies. This is a, a more suitable option for actually developing a crossbar-based application. The Docker image is, is better for deployment situations. I say this even though at the moment we're not using Docker for our deployments, but that's because our, we obviously haven't taken our product into full production yet. Uh, my assumption is that the DevOps guys are going to say, Docker or else, <laughs> the second we, 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 we start to hit the, the production level of things. So project management with Crossbar, once you've installed it, is pretty familiar. You're used to command line applications with Django, like Django Manage. Crossbar has something similar. You can spin up a new Crossbar node. From that point on, you then need to configure the node itself using a, a well, it's a, initially a JSON file, but you can actually migrate it to YAML, which makes things a bit easier because there's quite a lot to configure. Whereas with a normal configuration file for an HTTP framework like Django, you're mostly configuring stuff related to the framework itself. Crossbar serves not only the role of, of something, say, like Django, but it's also com handling communications at a lower level. So you have the option to configure various uh, features of the WebSockets communications, the packet size, stuff like that, which it means that your, your, your configuration file for Crossbar, there's a lot more in there that you need to worry about. But once you've got your head wrapped around it and what it all means, it's not too difficult to manage. So WAMP components. So these are what connect to your, your WAMP router, Crossbar in our case. They're pretty easy to write, um, especially if you're using the Autobahn family of libraries. Running them can be a little bit more tricky. Um, so. Covering this, what we mean by that is that Crossbar is essentially a process manager. It hosts three kinds of, of workers. There's a, a router worker, 
there's a WAMP container worker and a guest worker. Now, WAMP container worker is what you might expect to use to host your components, but it has some very specific restrictions in that it only allows you to host twisted Python components. So, a bit of side detail there, Crossbar itself is implemented in Twisted, and Tavendo, the guys behind Crossbar, were actually pretty instrumental in getting Twisted to work on Python 3. So at this point, if you use the, the WAMP container, you can use a Twisted component on Python 2 or Python 3. But if you want to use an async I.O. component, or you want the Crossbar Process Manager to run a Node component or a C++ component, you then have to use the guest container. The guest container essentially is, is pretty simple. It allows you to just run a process and say this is managed by Crossbar. And what that process is, well, it can be a WAMP component. It's not necessarily going to be a WAMP component. You could manage pretty much anything there. Um, but obviously, the main use for it is WAMP components. So one of the issues we ran into with this was that the, the application runner tool for running an async I.O. component doesn't allow you to run more than one component in the same Python process. So initially, this wasn't a problem for us. We would just you know, have lots and lots of instances of this guest container spinning up different Python processes, each one hosting a single async I.O. component. But this was a little bit wasteful. It's not really uh, ideally how you're going to host things. So we actually implemented a extended runner, which allows you to host multiple async I.O. components in a single guest process. And that's pretty useful. We've actually shared that open source. It's in PyPy. So anyone using Crossbar actually has access to this, which is nice. It's a bit of a, uh, just a, standby until the guys at Crossbar themselves actually implement support for async I.O. components into their, their uh, WAMP container system, but, and that's apparently coming, um, but it could take some time. So if we're coming from a synchronous world, um, which a lot of us are, um, there's a couple of things you obviously want to note. Um, the asynchronous, the async I.O. ecosystem is it's still maturing. There's a lot of um, there's probably a lot of work to be done there. It's definitely better than where it was some time ago, but there's still plenty of stuff to be done. So in fact, if you're looking for some open source projects to communicate, to contribute to the, the AO libs and so forth, that, that's a really good choice because it needs all the, all the love it can get. So probably the first place you're going to start looking is the AO libs organization on GitHub. Uh, they encompass a group of different uh, async I.O. libraries. There's ones that provide support for Redis, MySQL, Postgres, ODBC, ZeroMQ, Kafka, HTTP. Um, and, and in fact, obviously, the AO HTTP library is a big deal because so many modern services use HTTP. So having that AO HTTP library gives you a lot of flexibility with regard to what you connect to with your asynchronous code. Um, it's also worth noting that um, AOES, which is on AO libs, is something you can use to communicate with Elasticsearch, but has just been deprecated because the official async I.O. Elasticsearch client is out. And in fact, the guy who developed that client, along with the synchronous one, is giving two talks at PyCon this year. So yeah, you should probably probably give his talks a, a show of support because uh, he's done a lot of great work with the with the both, the both the synchronous and the asynchronous Elasticsearch libraries. The ORM situation is one which a lot of people are going to be interested in, um, and it's probably the trickiest, um, well, the sharpest corner in the asynchro ecosystem. You don't really have a lot of choices. There is an asynchro layer for SQL Alchemy, but it's largely restricts you away from using what you'd normally use SQL Alchemy for. You can basically, basically use the SQL expression language and not much else. And for some use cases, that might be cool, but I think a lot of people using SQL Alchemy are used to various power user features it provides, and they'll miss those. There are a couple of other Python ORMs out there, Pony ORM, SQL Object, so forth, that don't have any, any kind of async I.O. support, so you, you know, your SOL if you want to use those. What we found was that your best bet is Peewee. So Peewee is famous slash infamous for implementing an entire ORM in 2,000 lines of code in a single module. 
Um, some people find this to be gravely, gravely insulting. Other people think it's pretty cool. Um, and it happens to have a really nice async I.O. layer. In fact, there's more than one project to provide async I.O. for it, but we use the project called Peewee Async. And what that implements is essentially a, a Django manager style system on top of Peewee's ORM. And that actually works really well. Um, obviously, if you use Django ORM, you're used to going model.objects. whatever query. So in this case, you'll define an, an objects manager essentially, which behaves in an asynchronous fashion. And that allows you to use most of the features of Peewee very, very simply and easy in an asynchronous fashion. And yeah quality of life there is pretty pretty good um, so in our opinion if you're if you want to do async IO or um, peewee async is really the only logical solution at this point in time so <coughs> if you are using a library which does not have an async IO alternative what are your choices well you can either use the blocking version of the library but that's problematic, obviously, in asynchronous code where you have a single-threaded event loop running. So you can either obviate that by doing a lot of caching, maybe with our Redis, and trying to uh, make the synchronous hits as few as possible. But obviously, uh, caching is not always a pattern you can apply. Obviously, cache invalidation being one of the, the, the true nightmares of, of code. Sometimes you just don't want to deal with that. So luckily, AsyncIO provides a system for executing synchronous code via a thread pool called executors. So obviously, this is going to introduce some complexity into your code because you've gone from having a single-threaded application to having a multi-threaded application. But AsyncIO makes managing that a little bit simpler and cleaner. So if you have no other choices, then using the AsyncIO executor system is not, it's not forbidden. You know, you can do it. You just need to be careful. And from what I've seen, there are a couple of AsyncIO libraries already out there which are actually doing this. This is how they are giving you an AsyncIO version of something. They're actually using executors because, you know, implementing maybe a fully asynchronous protocol for something is a lot of work. So let's move back to the situation with Autobahn and Crossbar. So when you're working with Crossbar and Autobahn, you're going to find compared to your average HTTP application framework like Django or Flask, it's pretty minimal. There's not a lot there. But what you'll find is that you don't really miss it. There's a lot of the complexity that you get bundled in with HTTP frameworks kind of exists because of HTTP. Um, they're a side effect of, of that protocol's features. Uh, routed RPC calls obviously take the place of most of your standard HTTP methods. Um, get, post, update, patch. Well, that's just calling a specific RPC method. Uh, the RPC method will obviously you know, implement that operation. PubSub doesn't really have a direct comparison in HTTP web frameworks. Obviously, there are kind of ways of doing it using long polling and so forth, but you probably want to avoid those um, in the future because they're the old way of doing things. Um, one of the things you might find quite interesting if you're working with Crossbar and Autobahn for the first time is there's no real concept of thread local request response objects, nothing like that. When you have um, <coughs> an endpoint function that's called for handling RPC, you know, you get the parameters directly. They're already deserialized into Python data types. You don't have to worry about like constructing additional request response data. There are no HTTP headers to worry about. This is because by comparison with HTTP, WebSocket is a much lighter protocol. The amount of data that gets sent with each WebSocket message as compared to an HTTP one is a lot, a lot less. It's quite minimal, in fact. Um, this actually makes for some interesting debugging in the browser when you're looking at the client side because when you're looking at HTTP requests, you're, gonna, you're used to seeing a lot of stuff about headers and so forth, whereas WebSocket frames are yeah, <laughs> very lightweight. So we mentioned data. The input and output is automatically serialized and deserialized um, by the Autobahn library and crossbar and so forth. This obviously does have some implications. You can't just stick daytime objects in your output data and expect them to get magically handled. Uh, you need to deserialize them custom. Unfortunately, this is one slightly rough area with Autobahn and Crossbar. They don't really provide you with a way to say, use this custom JSON encoder decoder class. So there are a couple of ways of getting around that. 
Um, one way we've used, which is a little bit sneaky, is in our Pee-wee requests, actually just asking the SQL database to format date times to a string, because that's what it's going to come out as anyway. So, and obviously just, you know, defining that all our date times are going to be an ISO 8601 string and make sure that everyone working with the system knows this. Um, whiskey style middleware is something everyone is used to. Um, that doesn't really exist in the context of, of Crossbar and Audubon because you don't have, uh, as I said, request to response objects. You can model a lot of the behavior you would use middleware for by just wrapping your endpoint functions and decorators <coughs> and to some extent using inheritance. It really depends on what kind of effects you're trying to achieve. Other than that, everything else is up to you. You can implement things however you wish, as long as it just fits into the general concept of how you're going to write your application components. So let's talk a little bit about component-based application design. Um, as, as I mentioned before, so Crossbar is a system where you have multiple WAMP components communicating with each other via a router. This means that you're writing code which is inherently modular, and it also has locational transparency. You're going to write compo components that may not be running on the same system as the com components they're communicating with. And that communication that happens between components is bidirectional. So this, this makes a lot of, um, it changes the way how you think about the code. You're not, you don't want to treat code necessarily as being running in the same process or thread or even the same system. And that, that actually, I think in the long run in terms of scaling has positive benefits because it actually stops you from getting into dangerous habits where you assume maybe you have shared memory or you have a shared hard drive, anything like that. So this is one area where the different Autobahn libraries differ slightly. But since we're talking about Autobahn Python, Autobahn Python implements components using classes. So you have a class, methods on it are mapped to RPC endpoints or topic handling endpoints. There are a couple of utility methods on that class which will handle um, the WAMP connection process, the well, disconnection process, potentially the reconnecting after a disconnect, that kind of thing. But generally, you're going to have the model of a method is tied to a URI, and it will either get called directly via RPC or it will respond to an event. So this is actually pretty familiar for um, compared to modern web frameworks where you're used to registering functions and receiving you know, requests and so forth. So that shouldn't be a huge adjustment. But as I mentioned before, the modularity and the locational transparency do have some implications for how you design your components. So there's a lot you could I could talk about here, and there's a lot you could do, but I'm just going to leave some points, which is stuff we think you shouldn't do, and maybe a few things you should. Just don't store state on component class instances. It's, you know, if, you, if your components, if you have multiple instances of the same component running connected to the router, and maybe, so you have essentially got round robining on an RPC endpoint. You can't write code where you assume that this RPC call can access some state stored on the component instance because it might not be there on a different instance of the class. So you're going to get into issues there. So the best, best approach is really to just assume that even though these endpoints are on a class, they're not on a class. They're standing in um, isolation, and you sh should avoid accessing anything mutable outside of, outside of that um, function. Don't interact with other component classes other than via RPC and PubSub. So again, you could go, okay, well, there's a class method on this class. I'll just call it but that's making assumptions that all your code is part of the same code base and is deployed in the same way everywhere, and that's a dangerous assumption to make. It's, it's simpler and cleaner to actually just communicate using the WAMP methodologies, and this actually allows you quite a bit of flexibility because you can, you can call other RPC endpoints in a way that you might not expect to do initially um, but as you get into the system, you realize it's actually a good usage of it. So we actually use this to implement an export functionality. For a while, we're looking at our code going, okay, we've got code which produces this output data. How can we write an export? Okay, we could bundle all the code up into common you know, libraries and so forth and extract and extract, extract and refactor and refactor and refactor and so on and so forth and make the export system use this code. But then we realize we already have code which is producing data output. 
So why, why are we reinventing the wheel? We'll just call that endpoint with specific data and save it to a different format. So instead of necessarily returning it to a web application, we'll save it somewhere else. So this is actually a really nice usage of RPC that you might not consider using an HTTP application because, I mean, maybe other people have done it. I certainly haven't ever encountered uh, an HTTP web application, Django or otherwise, where, you know, someone calls an export like path and in that thing they then make another HTTP call to another endpoint in their own system. It's not something you tend to see very commonly, uh, possibly because of the blocking nature of, of that system. Um, don't perform long-running work in your endpoints. So obviously because this is running on a single threaded event loop most of the time, long-running work is obviously going to block the event loop, but that can actually have consequences beyond what we where you think oh it's just going to stop other you know other calls to this endpoint from happening the WAMP and WebSocket connection obviously relies on communications to maintain the connection if you block an RPC endpoint for long enough you're going to cause that WAMP connection to time out and then you're going to your component is going to lose connection to the router and unless you've actually written error handling code to deal with the scenario, you're going to end up with a component which is completely disconnected and then just needs to be restarted to get it back up and running, which you can just avoid by avoiding doing long-running computations. If you do have to do it, you use asyncio.sleep if possible. You can also use the progressive call results system which Crossbar provides. So this is actually... It's a, it's a feature of, of WAMP RPC, which the most obvious use for it, which is easy to understand, is a progress meter. You can have an RPC function, which is called, and then it progressively sends back progress on the work it's doing to the other, to the callee. And that's, uh, so obviously, as I said, that's a useful system to also chunk your work up and, and break it out. That also has implications due to there are certain limits on how much data you can actually send and receive in a, in a WebSockets packet. And there was a particular question on the CrossBio group, someone asking, hey, how do I upload or download large amounts of data with an endpoint? Doesn't CrossBar and WAMP automatically chunk up the packets? The answer is no. As I said, it's the, the, there's, there's a f minimal hand-holding in certain regards, so if you want to do chunking, you actually have to implement it yourself using progressive results. Um, blocking calls, as I mentioned earlier, you want to avoid that in async IO code, but you can kind of get away with it at the module level or inside your constructor init function. It's not going to cause too many problems there, although obviously if your blocking call takes forever, then that means your component is going to take a long time before it's ready. Right. Um, right, so authentication and authorization, that's actually baked in at the router level. You configure, you, configure it, you configure it in the node configuration and you can have static or dynamic authentication. The static is obviously completely configured in the configuration file. The dynamic implementation actually makes use of components. So you have a component which implements an RPC endpoint which when a client connection is established, it then calls that component, crossbar calls the component and says, authenticate this connection. And you've got a lot of flexibility there. You can, there are a lot of provided authentication methods that you can piggyback off. You can even use the, the humble anonymous method. You could implement a custom anonymous authenticator, which then limits anonymous connections to a certain level. Um, authorization is similarly implemented using components. When an action reaches the router of a specific type, this component gets called, it gets asked, does this session, is it allowed to do this action? And there are quite a bit of restrictions on that because that authorizer only receives information on the URI being called, the action that's been requested, and the session, the connection details. So if you're thinking, I'll write a authorizer which inspects the, the data sent to a call to determine whether or not it's valid, you can't do that. So if there is any data in a call that you want to inspect, it needs to be part of the URI. But that in turn obviously means, you know, you don't want your URI to be like 2,000 characters long and full of data. So that you've got to think a little bit about how you're going to implement um, your authorizers. And that was something we spent a bit of time up front thinking about how we're going to do our URIs and get them right. I think we did a decent job there. So we're getting close to the end. Um, debugging and testing. <laughs> 
Initially, that seems a bit difficult because Crossbar is a process manager, but then you realize you can actually just run individual components separately using PyDevDU normal breakpoints, and that works really nicely. You can then restart that component and iterate on it as you fix issues and so forth. Um, and then breakpoints are obviously something you've got to be careful of in asynchronous code. If you put a breakpoint on um, an await statement, which obviously yields control back to the event loop, you can't step over that because the next line of execution is not going to be the next line of code on your screen. So you just need to keep that in mind and maybe set your breakpoint after the await statement. Interactive testing was something we also found a bit tricky um, before our web front end was available to you know do you know interactive work with. So we implemented a REPL system, um, which obviously was very nice to have. You, one tends not to find asynchronous friendly REPLs, and that's because uh, the Python REPLs don't really support awaiting. So we actually have a system which essentially wraps the wraps the asynchronous nature in a synchronous call and then sort of lets you know when it's done. That's really nice to work with. Um, and we're actually open sourcing that because we think a lot of other people will find it useful to work with. Automated testing, um, there are a couple of options, PyTest, AsyncIO, AO, unit test, but you don't have a huge range of options there. And even when you're working with PyTest and AO unit test, you'll find that mocking out asynchronous libraries is maybe a little bit more work than you're used to in a synchronous environment. So yeah, second to last slide, and I'm running a little bit over time here. Um, so danger, yes, some things that you need to know. You may think that because your code is single-threaded, it cannot deadlock or have resource contention issues. You would be wrong. It is entirely possible for a single-threaded um, application to have deadlocks and resource issues if you're using concurrent multitasking. So the, the scenario we ran, we ran into here was a function was wrapped in a decorator which provided with, an, with, an, with a MySQL connection, an asynchronous one. It then called another function which also used that same decorator which provided a connection and that's when things went hilariously wrong because obviously lots and lots of calls to the first function, you would end up in a situation where the first function got its connection, it yielded control, and was waiting for the second function to get its connection. But it would never get a connection because the pool was, it was empty. And this was, was interesting um, to encounter. And we discovered that you know you need to be careful. You do actually need to think about this. It's not just a case of, oh, my code isn't multi-threaded, it can't deadlock. If you're using any kind of multitasking, whether it's cooperative, multi-threading, multi-processing, things can go wrong. So it's not, you know, you can't just go, okay, I'm async IO, I don't care. Um, file IO in Python and in fact on POSIX systems is blocking. Um, this is not something one tends to read about much unless you actually dig in, but it's got to do with um, implementation stuff at the POSIX level. So if you want to do file IO, then maybe you use IO files, which uses an executor pool to get around it. Um, Peewee async, one slight caveat is that you can accidentally perform synchronous calls. If you access related fields on a object which has been unmarshaled, it will actually try and make a synchronous call. And that's because of limitations in how PV async works. Best thing to do is just tell PV async not to allow asynchronous calls and then you'll get exceptions when you do the wrong thing. And this is the final one. Obviously for people who are used to async IO, this should be obvious, but it is not necessarily obvious. Calling a coroutine does not start it running. So unless you await a coroutine or manually attach it to the event loop, calling it just creates a future which is sitting there doing nothing. So uh, you, need to, you need to actually be careful with this because it, you can think, okay, I'm doing, I'm doing things asynchronously, but you're actually not. Conclusion. Um, right, I know this is a bit rushed and a little bit of a stumble early in the talk. Um, overall, our experiences with Crossbar have been positive. It's been nice to work with. It's refreshingly simple compared to a more classic um, web application where there's lots of layers of middleware, there's various bits and bobs that you've got to think about. Compared to that, much simpler on a certain level. On another level, obviously, you've got to think about a lot of stuff that you haven't been thinking about before. Asynchronous connections, are you handling, are you writing asynchronous code which isn't going to accidentally stall the event loop, that kind of thing. Um, flexibility is great. Um, the WAMP system actually allows you to implement some really interesting features. So part of our product, we implemented a demo system and that actually 
mocks, it essentially proxies RPC calls. So when the system is running in demo mode, an RPC call to URI X will actually get redirected to a completely different RPC call, uh, well, a completely different RPC endpoint in the system which provides demo data. So in that way we can jump into demo mode in a system which the, the front end part of the system doesn't know or care about. The back end is just like a single flipper switch and it's demo mode. There's no live data being uh, messed around with. So yeah, I guess the question is, is Crossbar uh, a good choice for your application? Well, if you have a legacy multi-page web application, it's not a great fit because obviously every time you navigate to a new page, you're going to open a new WebSocket connection. Um, due to the authentication management in Crossbar, you, that connection won't actually have to re-authenticate. It'll just re-establish using the old credentials. But obviously, you're opening and closing connections, which is kind of what you want to avoid. It's a really good fit for modern single-page web applications and also mobile application backends where you know you don't necessarily need all the heavyweight stuff of, of HTTP. You really just want to talk to a server, send information to it, get information back. Um, it's a great fit for soft real-time applications. So chat applications, Slack, Discord, these are built on WebSockets. Obviously both have hilarious problems of their own that you've probably seen if you're using. So Slack, you may have encountered hopping onto a VPN. Slack doesn't know what to do. It, it can't communicate. You have to restart it. Discord, on the other hand, if you're using a mobile connection, yes, you've probably seen sending the same message multiple, multiple times. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I think it's, it's definitely something to do possibly there with Electron, which is the underlying system they use because it seems to make WebSockets a first class part of the system, but I think it maybe doesn't give people a lot of hand-holding on how to handle certain scenarios, which are tricky. Yeah, and bonus, plays nice in multi-language projects, as I've said, since your components are disconnected and disparate, and there are a lot of uh, client libraries available. If you have a component which is too slow in Python, just implement it in C++ and throw it in there. Great. And that's the talk. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we, because we're running a little late, we probably Good only Lord. have time for one question. Uh, My leg literally went to sleep. Something okay. weird happened. <laughs> Too close right. for comfort. Time for one question. Um, if you have a question, please wait for the mic to arrive. Going once. Yes. Thank God. One question. You were discussing some of the pitfalls of waiting on an external result where this could result in your, origi your originating side essentially tearing itself down. Now, there are some other things such as Twisted that don't struggle with this as much. Mm. Do you have any specific opinions, approach, differences? I, I think uh, you, you mentioned Twisted. So I think I think I mean it's it's it could well be due to the the, the relative immaturity of async IO compared to Twisted, um, and I and would imagine that's going to change over time as people start to invest more effort into the async IO system. I mean it, it's probably worth noting that async IO is very strongly derived from the the approaches behind Twisted. I would imagine at some hypothetical distant point in the future maybe async IO will completely supersede Twisted, but knowing how people are about their projects, that's probably not that likely. <laughs> okay, so there's no abstractions like how Deferred manages the asynchronicity and task structure over time. At, at present, you get to do all that yourself. Still. Yeah, you've, do, you've got to do a bit of DIY there. I think uh, Twisted obviously provides a lot more kind of task management primitives or that kind of thing. Um, async IO, you know, you can do stuff that you would expect, like gathering multiple async IO requests into a single future, so then you're waiting on a list of futures rather than a future of lists, that kind of thing that is maybe the bare minimum for management. Um, but definitely, I think compared to also just thinking about futures in, in other languages I've worked with, there's still a lot of work to be done in async IO. There's a lot of stuff that you would expect to be able to do, which is just not there yet. Thanks. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank <laughs> you.